permanent equity? Yeah, so um, permanent equity is, uh, we like to describe ourselves as a family of companies that buys family owned companies. So technically we're a private equity firm now. Um, we were um, just a, a small collection, it was my own capital. And in the beginning I was an entrepreneur and, uh, and then accidentally bought a business about 10 years ago. And that's what led into kind of what we do today. Um, but uh, we mean? raised a- You accidentally well, bought a business. Yeah, so uh, I had a mutual acquaintance say, hey, you should meet this guy, he's in your, he's in your industry. And uh, he just got left at the altar for the second time. And I took that to mean I should try to buy his business because why else would you tell me that? He had no idea. He was just trying to connect two people that were you know, in, the same, uh, in the same field or similar fields. And so, uh, I don't know, I look about what, 24, 25 now. I looked about 13 or 14 then and uh, sat across from this guy and told him I wanted to buy his business. And uh, he, he, uh, he laughed at me and said, two, two grown men have tried to buy, buy my business. Uh, how in the heck do you think you're going to do it? And I said, I don't know, I'll figure it out. And we negotiated and uh, he uh, told me no thank you. And uh, then seven months later, called me back up and said, uh, all right, let's move forward and get it done. So what was your company before? So I uh, started a, a kind of collection of regional marketing companies. Uh, we had started in 2007, kind of really got going in 2008 and nine, uh, which were, as you all know, interesting times. Uh, but uh, it actually allowed us to grow and uh, we adopted some video technology and it becoming standard. We think we were probably the first people in the, uh, uh, in the uh, world to use it for commercial purposes. But uh, what does this mean? What's regional marketing? You know, we were doing, look, we were doing like ad agency type work. We were doing media buying. We were doing um, um, digital work, um, you know, uh, trying to scrap and claw and, and sort of make a go of it. Um, you know, so you're just an, you're, you're an agency just figuring it out. Yeah, we were an agency. We had some unusual talents kind of under that agency because being in mid-Missouri, we didn't have access to a lot of specialty groups. So we started building out our own specialty groups. So we built out research. Um, we did some uh, mobile and app development as well. Um, and, uh, and then some film work. So those were kind of the three unusual buckets that you typically don't get into an agency. And how big did it get? Yeah, give us a sense of the like level of success. I think a lot of people, <laughs> one of the things we hear a lot is from the audience is like, they hate when we fast forward and someone's like, yeah, I did this thing. And then all of a sudden these amazing yeah. opportunities opened up and they sort of were like, wait, where were they before? And so give us the before picture. How were you doing? How was that business doing financially? Did it, was it a big business, small business? You know, yeah. What, what was that business like? Yeah. So we, um, so let's see here. So um, I'm trying to, it's been, been a while since I've thought about the numbers. Um, so we grew to 26 employees. I think at the peak of that kind of before we were, um, so we were, look, we were doing fine. I could make a living doing it, uh, make a good living doing it. It wasn't, um, you know, the agency business is hard. It's really, really hard. And I think that's uh, um, probably what I've learned in my career is I've made all the mistakes. I've tried and tested a lot of business models and you sort of taste and try something and you're like, oh, didn't realize how hard that was going to be. And you sort of, you know, move around. Um, and so, you know, I would say, you know, moderately successful regional marketing firm, um, nothing special. I mean, I would say, um, you know, when, um, um, yeah, when, when we bought the, the firm that we did called Media Cross, um, you know, we were kind of co-equals is how I describe it, kind of in the marketplace. Um, they were much more focused on uh, government contracts than we were. We didn't have any government contracts. And so I was really attracted about the acquisition. And um, being able to combine those uh, organizations uh, gave us a lot more um, cash flow than, than having them separate just based on cross-selling different products that we had and being able to fulfill a lot more of the, um, uh, a lot more of the uh, gross profit through sort of the larger organization that they had been farming out some stuff. So that was, uh, that was kind of a nice combination. Wait, so did you buy that first company under the umbrella of your, of your marketing business? Yeah, yeah, correct. Got it. And so, and so it wasn't its own entity. No, well, I mean, it was, I mean, if you want to speak technically, it was its own entity, but it was a hundred percent owned by me and a hundred percent of the other firm was owned by me. So, I mean, it's shared resources. Got it, across got the it. Board. So you didn't have a co-founder yeah. or any outside investors or anything. Yeah. So I bought it with an SBA loan. Um, thank God for the SBA. Um, and so, um, no, it was, it was just a, it was an SBA loan and uh, rolled the dice. And so just to give people a sense of where you're at now, uh, I think, Permanent equity, you guys raised a, a second fund, uh, $248 million. It's a 27-year right. fund, which I think is interesting, <laughs> and you can talk about that. Uh, yeah. And you have a 10-year investment period. And so um, right. so the first fund, $50 million. Second fund, $250 million, roughly. Um, so what are you guys up to? Explain what the model is here and why that should be interesting for people. Yeah, well, so um, if you think kind of from first principles, um, it, families got wealthy by uh, – 
getting involved in a business and holding it for a very long time and then over time using those cash flows to uh, either fund new investments or opportunities. Um, and so we just have very much the same lower mindset. Um, you know, private equity is kind of the main methodology of how people have bought and sold companies in the past. And it's a very short time clock, if you think about it that way. Um, you're really, um, uh, from the time you buy to the time you sell, it really needs to be probably no more than four years or five years at most. And that's if you catch it kind of early on in the life cycle. Um, most private equity funds are seven years with three one-year extensions. So up to 10 years maximum. Um, I mean, Technically, if you can't sell the asset, you can go longer than that and everyone gets irritated at you, but you're expected to sort of uh, have the capital returned. And so what that uh, forces is, is, you know, you just can't think longer than your time horizon for holding the business. And so um, when you combine that with, a, uh, you know, most private equity firms are trying to put in as little equity as they possibly can and maximize the debt. And so what you end up doing is you take these great family businesses that have been around for a, a long time. Um, uh, you're sort of hitting them with the needle and trying to supercharge them to grow them and get a higher multiple when you sell. And you're making just very short-term decisions by necessity. Um, and you're opening yourself up, which is pertinent now. It wasn't as pertinent three or four weeks ago, but now you're opening yourself up to a lot of downside risk. Um, that you just can't withstand nearly as much shock as, uh, as you could if you didn't have any debt. So um, we've just really taken the opposite approach and said, uh, we want to own businesses like a family would. Um, so we buy with no intention of selling the business, and we're typically using no debt as part of our transactions, um, which in the private equity world means that we're the weirdest uh, duck in the world. So how yeah. much, uh, what's your total, what's the total revenue of the collection of companies then? Well, see, so uh, total revenue, gosh, I mean, uh, 100 and, oh gosh, 100 and. 80, 180 million, something like that. And then I imagine you guys try to run this like super profitably. So then if you have 180 million in revenue, I bet you have uh, 40 million in cash flow. Uh, let's see here. So hold on. I, I, you literally are putting me on the spot here. I've not done our calculations recently. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're highly profitable. I mean, the organization does real well. Um, I don't know if we're at 40 million because uh, we have some lower margin businesses. Um, we're lower than that, but, but yeah, we do real well. Um, and, and look, I, I don't own all of that anymore. Right. So, um, just from a, like, I don't want this to, <laughs> to come across differently than this. We've got investors. Um, the first fund owns, uh, five of those investments. And, and then I own, uh, four outside the first fund, um, uh, that were the, the, the group that we put together before we raised that first fund. And then the second fund, we haven't deployed any of that capital. Um, and, um, yeah, so we've got a bunch of dry powder. I mean, obviously it's, uh, been extremely fortuitous for us to raise at the time that we raised. And um, I've been having lots of conversations with our investors and uh, uh, there should be, should be lots of opportunity, lots of pain out there, which is unfortunate. And we've got to try to toe that line. We can talk about it between being a white knight and a loan shark. And uh, that's not an easy one to toe. Right. And so, uh, so let's just, if we just take a look at the, the portfolio as is, uh, what types of companies are you trying to buy? So you're trying to buy, um, is it a certain price point? Is it a certain, um, business model? Is it a certain type of owner? What are you trying to buy? Yeah, so uh, we first want to buy something that yeah, we think is going to be durable and around for a really long time. Um, so, you know, if you look at our current portfolio, we are uh, in the swimming pool business, um, like digging holes in the ground, shooting with concrete. Um, we're also manufacturing in that space as well. Um, another company that's unrelated in the backyard product space. Um, so a bunch of different SKUs that sell through mass retail. Um, we are, uh, we have a military recruitment firm. That was the first firm that I acquired, Media Cross. Um, we've got a, a, a military recruitment firm. So is that like lead gen for military? Yeah, so we actually, uh, so we work, I mean, we have a, a number of different clients, but one of our main clients is uh, a civilian branch of the Navy that resupplies the ships that never come into port. So it's called Military Seal of Command. And we're responsible for uh, finding and onboarding uh, all of their uh, staff on a yearly basis. So it's like a staffing firm for a ship. Yeah, well, for a whole branch of the military. So it's, it. uh, um, there's their, their staffing, I mean, there's a lot, uh, you know, 14, 15, 1700 uh, civilian mariners a year into that division. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty wow. large operation, but is uh, it digital? Uh, some of it's digital. Yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, you know, online, uh, application products, uh, but not mostly, some, uh, I mean, there's a lot of physical activities as well. We have physical Crazy. recruiters and, uh, it's, it, you know, online, offline, it's the, it's the not sexy, uh, where the rubber meets the road, real deal business. <laughs> so, so we were talking about some of the different businesses you guys owned. Uh, so media yeah. cross, which is a military recruitment firm, swimming pool business, backyard space. So you have a couple of there. 
So you were saying you're looking for durable businesses. That's like, let's yeah. say attribute one. Uh, what are the other sort of key attributes you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, so um, we want to find a leadership team that we can partner with. Um, there's so many, um, you know, it's so hard to grow a business, right? And so a lot of the businesses we're looking at, we, we, we either call it has been right before the line of professionalization, or maybe it's just crossed it. And there's this, this real interesting, you know, sort of in between gap where a lot of these firms, um, they're, they're too big to be small and too small to be big. And the leadership team's kind of capped out. They're just brute forcing as much as they possibly can, but they don't have the the systems, the talent on staff to be able to, to grow larger. And so a lot of the times we're, we're trying to figure out from them, you know, do they want to get bigger? There's some, there's some firms that we talk to and, and they say, well, even though they'll say, yeah, I want to get bigger, but the, you know, the CEO is answering 60 calls a day on his cell phone. And I mean, there's just no way. Right. Um, and so we're looking for a leadership team that I think has the base skills is really, really excellent at what they do. And we're looking for the, the company to have a position in the marketplace that is, um, protected somehow, right? So, I mean, we're not looking to get into just commodity type businesses. We want them to have something unusual about them that um, we can really build on and help them grow. Um, and then, you know, this is gonna sound like a, like a maybe a, a no brainer obvious one, but uh, we gotta get to a price in terms that, that, that are acceptable to both parties. Right. And um, there's roughly 400 decisions that have to be made sort of during the acquisition process. I mean, it's 400 opportunities to uh, not agree. And, and it's very difficult and time consuming. And so um, a lot of it is just trying to make sure that um, we think that a deal could be done uh, as well. And, and so when you say the leadership team can, you know, what you want them, you want them to scale. So why are they selling if, um, if you want them to stay in place? So they're not looking to kind of like go do something else or retire or whatever you, you want them to continue to operate. Yeah. And are they just looking for liquidity uh, what is the kind of core motivation to sell? And then do you have a problem where once they've sold or do you structure the deal so that they're still incentivized to, to, to stay on and do a good job? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, part of it is, so the leadership team and the, the ownership is, is not always the same thing. Um, so some of the, the organizations that we get involved in, um, the owner is, is very much part-time um, and hasn't been directly involved in the business for a long time. And so uh, for us, it's actually, that's a, that's a decently good situation because we love to just, you know, continuity of it, keep the leadership team, treat them well. Um, and, and try to augment the talents kind of as we go along. Um, some of the owners that, that, that we've got involved in uh, have stayed on and, and it's worked out great. The second body of the apple they get down the road be much larger than, than um, even their first payment despite them selling a, a majority of the company. Um, so uh, it really is, is situation to, you know, specific. I mean, I would say, um, yeah, for the most part, um, some are wanting to take chips off the table. Some you know, realize that they need help in scaling and growing. Um, so it's, you know, it's a variety of different reasons. I would say that, um, all of them have an exit somehow in their minds. I mean, if you're in your call it thirties or forties and you want to work for the next, you know, 30, 40 years, um, you know, I, I don't think many people like that are, are selling their business, um, at least in the size range and the style of businesses that we buy. Hey, earlier you said.